saying, hello, what are you doing in your pyjamas and dressing gown at this time of day? It's past nine o'clock. Is it? I must have overslept. And what are you wearing under your pyjamas? <gasps> Trousers. Really, Morris, one of these days you'll go to bed with your socks on too. There's a song about that, isn't there? Oh, yes, there is. Let's sing it. And with any luck, you might wake up by lunchtime. Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son John Went to bed with his trousers on One sock off and one sock on Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son John Your turn, Morris. Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son John Went to bed with his trousers on One sock off and one sock on Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son John Together? Yes! Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son John Went to bed with his trousers on One sock off and one sock on Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son John Morris, here comes Polly the plane. Now get dressed quickly. But I don't wear clothes in the daytime. I've got my fur. Oh, well, get undressed then. Polly doesn't want to see scruffy hamsters in dressing gowns, do you, Polly? Morning, hamsters. Sorry, what did you say, Doris? I was just telling Morris that you like to see everyone all neat and tidy first thing in the morning. Oh, yes. If I didn't shout at the tumble downies, I think they'd slop around all day in pyjamas and dressing gowns. <laughs> see, Doris, I'm not the only one. Listen to what those tumble Danny's got up to the other day. The Tumble Downies Suits. One morning, I was fast asleep on my runway when Digby and Leroy and Spot came running into Tumble Down Town. Morris and Doris are having a party, they cried, and everyone's invited. That's why I had to have a bath this morning, added Spot. Yuck! A party? I said. Oh, jolly good. Let's go and tell the tumble downies. I think they're down by the pond. When we reached the pond, what do you think we saw? Tumble downies with their hair all over the place and tumble downies with their clothes all torn. Look at your clothes, I shouted. All torn and dirty. You can't go to the party looking like that. Party? What party? cried the tumble downies. Morris and Doris's party, said Leroy. It starts at two o'clock. Oh, but it's one o'clock now, I wailed. What are we to do? Make some new clothes for the tumble downies out of your old parachutes, <laughs> said Digby. You what? said Spot. What's a parachute? It's a big white thing for floating down through the sky, you silly dog, I said. That's a good idea, Digby. Run and get my old parachutes. We all set to work. Spot bathed the tumble downies with a hose. Leroy cut up the parachutes and Digby sewed them into neat little white suits with his gardening string. Come along, tumble downies. I cried, put your new suits on and off well, jolly well go. I started my engine and soon we were all flying high above Magic Mountain on our way to Morris and Doris's house. Suddenly, my engine started making strange noises. Burp, boop, burp, it went and then it stopped. Hang on, I said. We're going to have to go down for repairs. We landed with a bump, and all the tumble downies set to work to repair my engine. In no time at all, the dear little things had got me going again. Ha! And then I saw their new white suits. Oh, no! Look at you, tumble downies. Your lovely suits are all covered in oil. By the way, said Leroy. I forgot to tell you that it's a fancy dress party we're going to. Well, that gave me an idea. Tumble downies, I said. You can paint on oily stripes and go to the party as zebras. Ha! 
Leroy, you can put spots of oil on yourself and go as a leopard. What about me and Digby? asked Spot. What can we go as? You two can make yourselves as messy as possible and then you can go to the party as tumble down is. <laughs> what fancy dress are you going to wear, Polly? asked the tumble down is. I'll have to think while we're traveling, I said. And as we flew off again into the sky, I thought that when we landed, I might take my propeller off and go to the party as a jet plane. What's that noise? I don't know. I don't know either. Maybe it's a great big ogre. Or a scary troll? No, it isn't. Look, it's only Nigel. Hello, everybody. Can you hear my squeaky shoes? My shoes are new and squeaky shoes. They're very shiny, creaky shoes. I wish I had my leaky shoes that Mother threw away. I liked my old brown leaky shoes much better than these creaky shoes. These shiny, creaky, squeaky shoes I've got to wear today. Oh, Morris, you do look smart with your fur all neatly combed. I'm still wearing my dressing gown. No, you're not. Well, I'm pretending, rather like the emperor in the story. Uh, which emperor? Which story? Listen, and Carol will tell you. The Emperor's New Clothes. There was once an emperor who loved clothes more than anything else. He had different clothes for every hour of the day, and whenever anyone asked, where's the emperor? The answer was sure to be, he's in his dressing room trying on clothes. And so he was, looking at himself in the mirror, admiring his newest suit or a pair of silk pajamas. One day, two strangers came to town. They said they were weavers. We can weave cloth more beautiful than any that was ever woven before, they said. It's a strange and special cloth. We take ordinary silks and threads, but when we have woven them together on our loom, the finished cloth is so fine that only the wise and the clever can see it. To stupid people, our wonderful cloth is quite invisible. What luck! thought the emperor. Now I shall have the most wonderful clothes of any emperor, and I will find out who are my most stupid subjects. He gave the two weavers lots of money and asked them to stay at the palace and weave their special cloth. He supplied them with the purest silk and the most expensive gold thread, but secretly they hid it away in their bags. Although they sat at their loom all day, they were only pretending to weave. After several days, the Emperor sent his Prime Minister to see how the weavers were getting on. Tell them to work quickly, said the Emperor. I want a suit of new clothes made from the wonderful cloth in time for the big parade. So the Prime Minister went to the room where the weavers were working. He stepped up to the loom and looked, and looked, and looked. But he could see nothing, nothing at all. Oh, am I not clever enough to see the wonderful cloth? Am I stupid? He thought anxiously. No one must know. Above all, the emperor must not know. I might lose my job. What do you think? asked one of the cheeky weavers. Is it not the most beautiful, delicate cloth you have ever seen? Oh, yes, yes, indeed, most handsome, cried the Prime Minister, and he hurried back to tell the Emperor how wonderful the cloth was. <gasps> I can't wait another moment to see it, said the Emperor. Come, everyone! He swept into the weaver's room with his courtiers. They all crowded round the loom and looked and looked and looked. Nothing. Every man there thought, am I too stupid to see it? Nobody must know. 
so none of them dared to tell the truth. No, not even the Emperor. What do you think, Your Imperial Majesty? said the weavers. The Emperor didn't want anyone to think that he was stupid, so he quickly said, Yes, yes, the cloth is lovely, and everyone agreed. The day of the big parade dawned. The weavers sent word to the Emperor, The Emperor's new clothes are ready. So the Emperor and the Prime Minister and all the courtiers went to see the clothes made out of the special cloth. The weavers held them out proudly. Nobody could see anything at all, but everyone gasped with admiration. How fine, how elegant, how fashionable. Are they not magnificent? said the weavers, grinning. Try them on, your imperial highness. You will find them as light as air. The emperor took off all his clothes and allowed the weavers to dress him in his new ones. Ah! Up and down he swaggered in front of the mirror, feeling very pleased with himself. How do I look? Oh, so fine, so elegant, so handsome, said the courtiers and the weavers. Then shall we start the parade? And he walked grandly down the palace steps, followed by all his courtiers who fought each other for the honour of carrying the invisible train. The streets were crowded with people. They'd all come to see the Emperor's new clothes. Only clever people can see the lovely cloth, they said to each other wisely. So when the Emperor appeared, they gasped with admiration and cried out, Hurrah! Bravo! Look at the Emperor's new clothes! How fine he looks! No one wanted his neighbour to think he was stupid. Then a little boy's voice piped up. Emperor isn't wearing any clothes. Shh, said his father. But soon the words were murmuring through the crowd. The Emperor isn't wearing any clothes. At last, everyone was saying, The Emperor isn't wearing any clothes. The Emperor felt very foolish and ashamed. He knew they were right. What am I to do? Oh, I just have to keep on pretending until the end of the parade. So on and on he walked, right round the town, with nothing on, not a stitch. And behind him, his silly courtiers went on pretending too. Would you like a cup of tea? I've just made some. Oh, yes, please. Here you are, then. Thank you. Hey, Morris, mm? what's this floating in my tea? A tea bag? No, it isn't. It's uh, a sock. Morris, you're very, very naughty. Well, I was only pretending to be Jolly Roger. But he's just a character in a song. I know. Listen. Jolly Roger lived up a tree, you climbed there by a rope. I'd often go for a cup of tea, which he brewed up with soap. Once I found a sock in mine, it made me wince a bit. But Roger told me, never mind, it's old and doesn't fit. Little mice sat down to spin. Pussy passed by and she peeped in. What are you at, my little men? Making coats for gentlemen. Shall I come in and bite your threads? No, no, Miss Pussy, you'll snip off our heads. Oh, no, I'll not. I'll help you to spin. That may be so, but you don't come in. 
Now you be the mice, Morris, and I'll be pussy. Three little mice sat down to spin. Pussy passed by and she peeped in. What are you at, my little men? Making coats for gentlemen. Shall I come in and bite your threads? No, no, Miss Pussy, you'll snip off our heads. Oh, no, I'll not. I'll help you to spin. That may be so, but you don't come in. Would you like a cup of tea? No, thank you, Morris. Not if it's going to have a sock in it again. No, there aren't any socks in it. Promise. And no soap. No soap. All right, then. And while we drink our tea, let's have a story. Ready? Bing, bang, bong, rat-a-tat-tat. -tat -tat -tat. Let's have a story, just like that. The Parrot and the Rainbow. Pongo the parrot was the loveliest bird in the jungle. Everyone admired the beautiful colours of his feathers. What a beautiful yellow, said the leaves. And what a fine red, roared the lion. And what a heavenly blue, whispered the orchid. One day, as Pongo sat on a branch, warming himself in the sunshine, he heard someone crying. Oh, who's that? He called. What's the matter? It's only me, said a voice. Where are you? Said Pongo. I'm sitting next to you, wailed the voice. I'm a rainbow, but you can't see me because the rain has washed all my colours away. Pongo turned his head and sure enough, Sitting right next to him was a very small rainbow. He looked very pale and sickly without any colours. Oh, oh dear, you do look sad, said kind-hearted Pongo. Here, have my colours. And the parrot lifted his wings and shook his colours over the rainbow. At once the rainbow appeared in all his glory, his new colours dazzling in the light of the midday sun. Oh, thank you, thank you, shouted the little rainbow, and he floated joyfully up into the sky. Pongo the parrot went on sitting on the branch of the tree, warming himself in the sunshine. He felt quite happy, but now he looked as pale and sickly as the little rainbow had done. Goodness, what's happened to you? cried the leaves. He couldn't believe that this was Pongo, who had once been so colourful. Pongo told them how he had met the sad little rainbow and how he had given him his colours. You are kind, said the leaves. You must share some of our colours. The leaves shook themselves all over Pongo, and in a moment he had some of the prettiest, greenest feathers you've ever seen. The sky, who had been listening, said, You must have some of my blue as well. I've plenty to spare. Soon Pongo had feathers of shimmering blue as well as green. The wind spread the word through the jungle and soon everyone knew how kind Pongo the parrot had been to the little rainbow. Before he knew what was happening, he had been given every colour you could hope to see, from the yellow of the king lion to the deep red of the blushing orchid. Thank you! Oh, thank you! said Pongo. I never knew I had so many friends! Ah! Once again, he was the loveliest bird in the jungle. Hello, hamsters! Look, Doris, it's Dotty the dragon! Hello, Hello Dotty! Dotty. 
I brought you both a present. A box of my old clothes. Who'd want your old clothes? Sorry. They're great fun for dressing up in. Listen to the rhyme. Rhyme time! Rhyme. Hooray! Head to toe. What shall I wear today? I'll wear a hat, tall or flat. What shall I wear today? I'll wear a hat, tall or flat, and a long, long scarf that would fit a giraffe. What shall I wear today? I'll wear a hat, tall or flat, and a long, long scarf that would fit a giraffe, and an overcoat right up to my throat. What shall I wear today? I'll wear a hat, tall or flat, and a long, long scarf that would fit a giraffe, and an overcoat right up to my throat, and the warm woolly gloves that my sister loves. What shall I wear today? I'll wear a hat, tall or flat, and a long, long scarf that would fit a giraffe, and an overcoat right up to my throat, and the warm woolly gloves that my sister loves, and socks to the knees to keep out the breeze. What shall I wear today? I'll wear a hat, tall or flat, and a long, long scarf that would fit a giraffe, and an overcoat right up to my throat, and the warm woolly gloves that my sister loves, and socks to the knees to keep out the breeze, and shoes of leather to keep out the weather. That's what I'll wear today. Look, Doris, there's everything you can think of in Dotty's dressing up box. Except a hairbrush, by the look of things. What do you mean? Well, look at your fur. It looks as though it hasn't been brushed for a week. I don't need a hairbrush. Everybody needs a hairbrush. Listen to Nigel's story. The Clever Hedgehog. Henry the Hedgehog lived near the lake in the big dark forest. He had long prickly spines, a little round face, and a shiny wet nose that stuck up in the air when he curled himself up to sleep. Every morning, Princess Sophia would take her walk by the lake. Henry often watched her. I wonder why the princess is so scruffy, he would say. She looks as though she never brushes her hair. The king and queen were worried about how untidy the little princess looked. They tried all the hairbrushes in the kingdom, but none was strong enough to untangle Sophia's hair. What shall we do about our daughter? sighed the queen. I shall offer a reward to whoever makes our daughter's hair look tidy, said the king. So the palace guards were sent to the farthest corners of the kingdom to tell of the king's reward. Soon, the palace courtyard was filled with barbers, all trying to win the reward. They tried to cut the princess's hair, but their scissors only broke in two. They tried to comb the princess's hair, but the combs stuck where they were. They tried to pull the princess's hair apart, each barber taking a strand. They pulled and pulled until they made Princess Sophia cry. Stop! <laughs> cried the Queen. <laughs> Just then, Henry the Hedgehog walked into the courtyard. Excuse me, Your Majesties, he said. I've watched the people come and go, and they have all failed to untangle the princess's hair. Could I try, please? I suppose so, said the King, who was by now very tired. But you won't do it. My daughter's hair is like steel. So? Henry the Hedgehog rolled himself up into a ball. Please, Princess Sophia, he said. Will you brush your hair now? The little princess picked up Henry the Hedgehog and began to pull him through her hair. Harder and harder she pulled. There was a cracking sound and slowly her hair began to untangle. She was so happy that she brushed and brushed her hair all day long. And Henry didn't mind a bit. When her hair was neat and tidy, Princess Sophia tied a red ribbon around it and smiled. Oh, how beautiful you look, said the Queen. Thank you, little hedgehog. Now, said the King, what would you like for a reward? Nothing, said Henry. Just seeing Princess Sophia's hair, all neat and tidy, is reward enough. Well, 
said the king. I shall give you a title instead of a reward. You are now the Royal Hairbrush. And from that day on, Princess Sophia's hair was never untidy again. And Henry, the Royal Hairbrush, lived happily in the palace garden. It's me again, Dotty. Wearing some of your old clothes again, I see. These are not old clothes. They are my very best, newest ones. Listen to my song. If there's one thing I've a passion for, it's following dragon fashion for. I always like to stand out from the rest. And if I do say so myself, I've got some things upon my shelf that really are the very, very best. Look at my head, scarf, my handbag, and my pearls. They are the envy of the other dragon girls. Whenever I go walking, I can hear those dragons talking, so I show them how a magic dragon twirls. Though I'm never one to swank, it is me you ought to thank for showing how a dragon ought to look. When my twirling days are done, I am planning, just for fun, to write a magic dragon fashion book. Look at my head, scarf, my handbag, and my purse. They are the envy of the other dragon girls. Whenever I go walking, I can hear those dragons talking, so I show them how a magic dragon twirls. Yes, I show them how a magic dragon twirls. So I show them how a magic dragon twirls. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. 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 Go